Before we can talk about carbonate sediments or carbonate sedimentology or even the distribution of these sediments and sequence stratigraphy, we need to have a common language that we can use to designate carbonate rocks. That brings us to carbonate classifications. Well, welcome to the United Arab Emirates and in particular to Wadi Galila. This particular wadi is where one of my former PhD students did all of his work. We're surrounded by Jurassic carbonate rocks. And if you look around on the cliffs or if you look around at your feet, you see a lot of interesting structures. You can see shell debris, you can see large shells, small shells, you can see ooids, small grains. And so the goal today is to teach you how you classify these rocks and what is the common language that we use to designate carbonate rocks. So let's start with the basics. What we will be using is known as the Dunham texture classification. It's not recent, it was invented in the 60s, 1962 to be precise. And you have a slide here showing you the basic Dunham classification. Now it's important to know that the Dunham classification was based originally on thin sections. So it was entirely based on looking at thin section information and from those thin section deduct what the texture of the rock uh, was. And I'll show you in a few slides why this, this uh, Dunham texture uh, classification is so powerful and still used today. And also we'll see that we can use it not just with thin section but with hand specimen as well, although we need to be careful. And the reason we need to be careful is that central to the classification is the notion of carbonate mud or micrite. So let's talk about what micrite is and what it isn't. So micrite is a carbonate mud. We can also designate as micrite a mix of carbonate mud with clastic clays and, and silt. And that's absolutely fine. So on this picture here, you can see we have micrite partially filling a gastropod. So that's a geopetal structure. You can see that characteristic um, dark gray texture of the micrite. And there's also an arrow, white arrow, pointing to places where there is micrite in between the uh, other shell fragments that you see here that are more broken shell fragments. Now at the top of that uh, gastropod, what we see is that the pore space was filled with a new phase of cement. And cement is not micrite. Cement is a diagenetic product that fills void or pore space after deposition. So it's very different to micrite. Micrite is primarily a sediment, although we will see that you can micritize grain as a diagenetic process early in the depositional, um, the depositional framework of your sediments. But micrite is absolutely fundamental for our understanding of the Dunham texture. It's also why applying Dunham to hand specimen is um, a little less certain because you can never really be sure that you have micrite or not. When you have thin section, there's no doubt. When you have hand specimen, it's a primary classification and you may need to revisit your classification later. Okay, so let's build that Dunham classification texture from the ground up and we'll go step by step. The first step in the Dunham texture is to determine whether or not the depositional texture is still recognizable. And that's a really a key concept here in Dunham. We use the depositional texture. Most of the rocks you will see will have experienced some degree of diagenesis, dissolution, reprecipitation. You need to be able to strip that out from the rock and go back to how the rock was deposited. And that is both a, a difficulty of the Dunham classification, but also its power because it gives us information about the depositional environment. So if we can recognize the depositional texture, then the next question is, 
were the original components bound together at time of deposition. In other words, are we looking at something like a reef, a coral reef, or are we looking at loose sediments? Let's assume that it's loose sediments, so they were not bound together at time of deposition. So the next question is whether or not they contain mud, micrite. So if they have either clay or fine silt carbonates, then that leads us to our next question. Is the rock mud supported? Now, what does that mean, mud supported? It means that if you look at the thin section or at your hand specimen, the grains that form the, the rock are not touching. They're floating in mud. If that's the case and you have less than 10% grain in your, in your uh, matrix, then we call this rock a mudstone. Here's an example of a mudstone. This is a rock that is composed almost exclusively of fine grain micrite, with the exception of this reddish component there, and we're not really sure what um, this component is exactly. But what if you have more than 10% grain? Well then, if you have more than 10% grain, but you're still mud supported, so notice that in this diagram the grains do not touch, we call this rock a waxstone. And here's an example of a waxstone. You can see different skeletal component. There's definitely more than 10% skeletal component on this thin section, but there's mud in between the component, and so this is a waxstone. Now, if the grain, if you have a rock that contains mud but is grain supported, so here you see that the grains are touching, then we call this a packstone. And this is an important distinction here. It means that the framework of the texture is made by the support of the grain to each other. So that's a packstone. And here's an example of a packstone. Now, this is a very confusing example I'm showing you. And I do this on purpose. It's because if you look at this thin section casually, it appears that it's all micrite with a little bit of cement in between micrite. But if you look at it carefully, you can see that the micrite actually is forming grains. These grains are known as peloids. They're effectively fecal pellets that were micritized early during their life cycle. And so they are effectively grains of micrite. And because they're grains of micrite, in the Dunham classification, we consider, we consider them as grains. And you see that we have grains with some mud, some micrite around, and the grains are touching, those peloids are touching. So this is a packstone. Now, if you don't have any mud, but the original components are not bound together during deposition, then you are in what we know as a grainstone. And here's an example of a grainstone. So notice that compared to the previous example, we have the grains touching, in between the grains, we have a cement, not micrite, but a cement. So that indicates that this was pore space before it was filled by the cement. And those ooids then form a nice grainstone. And here's an example of a more complex texture, because one thing that we need to know is that you can have multiple texture in the same thin section. In this example here on the left, we have a grainstone, with cement in between the different grains. But on the right, we probably have what I would call a pack stone because you can see grain, but there's still micrite. So those texture can be complex and often rock will be uh, named with two textural names. For instance, this would be a grainstone pack stone or a pack stone grain stone. You would put the first name as the most abundant of the two textures. And the limit between these two texture is indicated by the white dashed line. Now, another thing that can happen in the Dunham texture is that the component are bound together at time of deposition, so like a coral reef or, or, or an algal mat. And if that's the case, they're not loose sediment, they're not locked in the sediments, and we call this a bound stone in this terminology. And here's an example of a bound stone. It's effectively a silicified stromatolite, but originally this, this was a calcium carbonate stromatolite, and it, was, it would have formed a texture known as a bound stone in the Dunham classification. Now, what's interesting here, if you look at this classification, is that it is a direct indication of wave energy. On the left, 
you have the mud stone and on the right you have the grain stone to bound stone and what this means is we are removing more and more of the finer grains uh, the finer grains the finer matrix and we are concentrating the grains more and more all the way to the bound stone that is you know, um, able to withstand some high wave energy. Of course, a bound stone can also form in low wave energy, so be careful, we'll talk about this. But the, the beauty and the power of the Dunham classification is really that you can relate this to wave energy. Now, if you cannot distinguish the original, the original texture, then you have a problem because you cannot apply the Dunham classification. And in that case, you call this a crystalline rock. And when you call a rock a crystalline rock, you pretty much give up in terms of Dunham. You cannot reconstruct its environment of deposition. And of course, that's a problem because the environment of deposition is at the base of all of what we do or most of what we do in sequence photography or in sedimentology. Here's a beautiful example of a crystalline rock. This is a dolomite. And you can see that the original texture of the limestone is completely lost. We're left with some large crystals of dolomite, but no original texture of the limestone. So we cannot apply a Dunham texture other than say, this is a crystalline texture.